want to represent your people. Need I tell you that PDP has an opportunity for you? And hold me to this. When we said, you know, you know, most of you do not know the, when Samson came to me to sponsor the Naughty Young to run, I needed to know who and who he has met. And he told me he had met some other honorable members that told him to go and bring money to lobby them. And my investigation revealed that it was APC lawmakers. And I am happy that Bella stood here to say that this movement and Yaga has remained apolitical, especially in a government that has done everything to drag them to become political. But we'll continue to remember them in our prayers. I want every one of you, please, if your hands are not busy, to give them a resounding applause for what they have been doing. In fact, give them a standing ovation. Please, they deserve it. <clears throat> give Yaga and the movement a standing ovation. <clears throat> I, can't, I can't hear you all. In conclusion, I would always say, I know Bella is always quick to time. She has given me, Bella, is this one or 11 minutes? Okay, it's like 11. Uh, in Convergence 2.0, uh, I said something. That a young boy, for those that weren't there, I'm going to repeat this again. A young boy went to meet uh, those soothsayers, you know, those that get to tell you about your future, right? While at it, the old man drew two circles. The old man drew the first circle with a chalk drew a second circle with a charcoal, brought a dead centipede. After a few incantations, the centipede started walking. And the man told the young boy, if this centipede crawls to the white circle, your future is bright. If it crawls to the Black circle, your future is doomed. And the young boy started watching the centipede keenly as the centipede started walking towards the whites. He was quite elated. And by the time he knew what was happening, the centipede did a U turn. And with a much higher speed started crawling towards the dark circle. The young man knew that if this centipede continued at this speed, he was going to get into that circle, even at the point he wants to apply brake. And you know what he did? At the edge of that circle, he bent down, picked up the centipede by himself, and threw it into the white circle. And the Baba asked him, why did you do that? The young man said, Baba, I will not stand and watch my destiny get doomed. My destiny is in my hands. That's why I picked the centipede and put that. You're all here gathered today. I want you to know that beyond all that will be said here, your destinies are in your hands as politicians. You must go home you must do the right thing. You must consult widely. 
and you must make the right choice when the time comes. And as Bella stands beside me, let me give you one political tip, the last, and I'll leave. I noticed the first speaker didn't do, leave you people with anything, but I'll leave you with something. And that is, there was an event. Please listen to me deeply. There was an event, and there was a high table. A poor man sat beside the, young, the uh, uh, high table while food was being served. They kept omitting him, going to the, which is exactly what is happening with this government at the moment. They kept omitting him, kept omitting him, serving the high table. When the man found out that this food was not going to get to him, you know what he did? He drew a bow and arrow came in front of all of them seated at the high table, pointed at them. At that point, he told them, if you open your mouth, I'll release the arrow. If you shut your mouth, I'll release the arrow. Those that their mouth was open, remained open. Those that their mouth was shut, remained shut. Until the event's host came to the, old, the young man and told him, okay, what do you want? He said, you've been serving all these people and you ignored me. They had to call the caterers, brought his own food, kept it at the chair where he was, and the woman came back again and said, my husband, I have been waiting for you to sit down so that I can serve your own specially. At that point, the man lowered his bow and arrow went and started eating. I hope you know the moral of this lesson. Even the young people are very important. And when you refuse to do that for you, draw that bow and arrow, let them keep their mouth open or keep their mouth shut until you get what you rightfully deserve. Thank you and enjoy your section. Thank you so much, Honorable Molo. I think if you're watching these two, I, it's important to emphasize that these two gentlemen are really good friends, and they do what politicians do, which is nag in public and then hug each other in private. So ignore anything that you've seen that seemed like it's really just banter. I thought I should emphasize that. And to also remind us all that the Not Too Young to Run movement is apolitical and we are not al aligned with any political party, not PDP, not APC, not YPP, not XYZ. I also felt like this was a good time to also reiterate the spirit of the movement, our core values, what binds us together, and you know, invite us all to think through this as we engage with one another over the next couple of days. Spirit, S for solidarity. P for patriotism. I for inclusion. R for responsible leadership. Another I for integrity. And T for trust. I hope that we keep this in mind, especially as we engage across parties with our brothers and sisters who have gathered here under the same you know, objective and you know, driven by the same goal. While we were speaking earlier, the Speaker of the Oyo State House of Assembly, Honorable, Right Honorable Adebo Ogundo, he joined us. I would like to invite him, actually, for a quick good goodwill message as well. Thank you so much, Right Honorable, for joining us. Uh, good morning. I want to use this opportunity to in thank every young person here present, and most especially thank Yaga for all the good work they've been doing in encouraging youth participation in politics. Um, to be honest, I think youth participation in politics 
is a personal journey. And I also believe that the role of Yaga is to encourage youth participation in politics. Because the truth is, um, Yaga, Yaga will not come to your constituency to help you campaign. Yaga will most likely not um, give you any funds to run your election. But the most important thing that Yaga can give us, it's a technical know-how, experiences of other people that have been in the position. Uh, we have other young honorable members here present. And um, on behalf of the Oyo State people and the Oyo State House of Assembly, I want to use this opportunity to thank um, one of the sponsors of the bill um, uh, for Yaga. And I want to thank Yaga itself as an, um, as an NGO in pushing that bill because, because of that bill, we have two members under the age of 30 in the Oyo State House of Assembly. We have... And um, this is not about being partisan, because we have other young speakers as well. The Zanfara speaker also. Uh, when I was sworn in, I was sworn in as the youngest speaker. Um, the Van Zanfara speaker also is um, a colleague, um, born in the same year. Um, also, the Plato speaker is also a year older than I am. He's APC. Um, we have the Quara speaker as well, who is about two years older than I am. He's also from the party APC, while myself and Zanfara are PDP. Um, as the organizers of this event have emphasized, this event is, not, is apolitical and doesn't have anything to do with one political party or the other. But one of the most important choices you can make as contestants is to identify what political party would um, help you to achieve um, your aspirations to represent your people. Um, it's almost like uh, religion. Uh, most of us didn't have a choice to choose. Um, we didn't have a choice to determine what um, religion that we, we, we practice today. Because most of the time, we are born into it. I, for example, I was born into the great party PDP. And for that reason, I, single, well, by myself, I'm determined to ensure that PDP is the best political party Nigeria can produce. And that statement is apolitical because I believe that my brother here, Sheya Adisa, who is also a member of the Oyo State House of Assembly, is also determined to ensure that APC is the best political party available to us. So if we all work together to ensure that whatever political party that we belong to is the best, then I can guarantee you that that's a bright future for the country. Um, I also like to um, emphasize the point that I'll just talk briefly on my experience and how I got to become Speaker of the Oyo State House of Assembly. I contested for election twice. Um, as of today, I am 34 years old. Um, my first foray into politics was when I was um, 31. And it, was, it came through a by-election, which I won. And then this was 2018. And then in 2019, I had to recontest again. So I had one year to prove to my people that I was capable and competent for the role and I had the capacity for the role. As of 2019, we recontested. And then I became a ranking member in a political party that had the most amount of honorable members. My point is that without all the factors coming together, I wouldn't be standing here before you as a speaker. And I'll leave you with one parting um, advice because um, um, the, you know, we in PDP, we like to leave you with knowledge. <laughs> I will um, leave you with this one single knowledge or advice. And it's simply that in all you do, you need fuel to, to back up your passion. You have to determine what your drive is. You have to determine why are you really doing what you're doing. For whatever reason, if it's a monetary reason, if it's to elevate your status in the society, if it's to actually make a change, whatever your reason is to make a difference, you have to ensure that you have your fuel. As for me, 
God Almighty is my foil. And I also encourage everybody to have a strong spiritual base because in my conversation with Shea this, uh, with, uh, yesterday from Ibadan to Lagos, we were talking about different problems of the country. But I believe that our most important problem is not religious. Don't get me wrong. What I mean is a spiritual backing in order for you to perform excellently. Because you always have to ask yourself at every step of the way, by the time you get there, which you will get there. Why are you doing what you're doing? What is your motive for doing what you're doing? And what do you want to deliver to your people at the end of your tenure? Because it's easy for you to lose sight. I've had to check myself numerous times and ask myself the real question. Uh, was this what I wanted to do? Was this what I'm trying to achieve? And if it is, then I can sleep well at night. What have I believed that are cheating my people, but well, I'm not giving them the best representation as possible, then I have myself to blame. So you need a strong spiritual center in order for you to succeed in politics. God will be with you. God will bless you. And God will guide you, give you the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding in order for you to succeed. Thank you for coming, and God bless you. Thank you, Right Honorable Ogundoi. The, not to, the Convergence 3.0 is hosted by Yaga Africa and the Not Too Young to Run movement. But we would not have accomplished this incredible feat without the support from the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome for special remarks the High Commissioner, British High Commissioner to Nigeria, Her Excellency Katriona Leong. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me if I stand here, because I think I'm going to be a little bit swamped under a slightly too high lectern. Let me just move this over a little bit. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be here among friends with Samson and with Cynthia and the great team at Yaga. It's one of the first things I did when I arrived in Nigeria three years ago um, was to engage with Yaga. I'd just come from Zimbabwe um, and done the elections there, and I was really recognized how powerful this voice of civil society and the youth can be. So I'm a huge fan of Yaga, and we're longstanding friends. It's good to be amongst friends, because I'm not the most popular person in Nigeria at the moment after the red listing of Nigeria. <laughs> and I want to personally say sorry if any of you have had your travel plans to the UK disrupted. Um, but unfortunately, this uh, new variant does look pretty serious, actually. Um, we're now at the community transmission stage. It looks like it's going up quite rapidly in Nigeria. I think we're all going to have to recognize and come to terms with, we've got to live with this thing. Um, so that's part of the context. The other bit of context wanted is orange. I think just to remind ourselves, we're at the penultimate day of 16 days of um, activism against gender-based violence, bring shoes, bring scarf. So I hope you're all, all also actively engaging in that terribly important campaign. But we're here to do, today to talk about you, the youth, future of Nigeria, and I wanted to say four things. The first is about the importance of this next election, the second is about the youth, the third is about women, and the fourth is about political parties. We've got two very interesting representatives here today, and I'm glad to hear they're friends, that's good news. So first of all, why does this election matter? We always hear the next election, it's make or break, but I honestly really believe for Nigeria, for Africa, for the world, the outcome of this election and the conduct of this election is, is massively important. You all know that you're in a region where actually democracy is backsliding. There have been three coups in West Africa recently, and then <clears throat> many states around uh, Africa um, where presidents are determined to hang on, go for a second term. One really positive thing about Nigeria, you've stuck with democracy since 1999. It's been a you know, little bit of a rocky road, but you have stuck with it. And uh, I think apart from on one occasion when one of your previous presidents tried to go for a third term, um, there's been no third terms, and your president is clearly stepping down, so there will be a change at the next election. So the world will be looking at this election. Will it be relatively secure? Will it be conducted relatively well? And will the outcome be one that the people of the country believe in and can rally behind the new leadership? 
that really, really matters, particularly for my government and I think the new US administration. We're very conscious that we're in a world of pretty hostile states, um, China, Russia, other malign actors. We need to build a coalition of democracies. That really matters, and that's something that our government is very focused on. I think Nigeria's been a bit neglected. We've looked at Indonesia, India, the other big democracies. I'm very clear that I will be able to tell a very positive story if this, this election goes well. But what will it need to go well? Well, it obviously needs to be secure. It needs um, the INEC to be able to deliver a good election. The Electoral Act hopefully will be passed soon by the president with the electronic transmission of votes. But fundamentally, it needs people to register to vote. And that's been reasonably encouraging. I'm tracking the progress, and the youth is, is, is registering quite well. But we need to really up the ante. And one of the reasons they'll register vote is they see people like themselves standing for election. So you, you need to not just register, but also encourage others to register and, of course, stand, stand yourselves. That will also, I think, encourage the political parties to take the youth vote very, very seriously. I, I say to all the potential candidates, don't fast, fast fight the last election. Youth will matter, women will matter, spouse, frankly, will matter more than perhaps it has done in the past, but only if people register to vote. Um, so the youth really matters. Um, Women. Um, sadly, Nigeria's been backsliding rather than moving forward. I mean, it's frankly disgraceful in this hugely powerful, important country that you've got such low representation of women. I hope this election will start to change that. So complementing what YAG is doing with youth, there's other campaigns going on, something called Elect Her, you may be aware of. So I hope you, the youth, particularly the women amongst you and the men, of course, will also come behind the various campaigns encouraging women to stand, not just young women, but all women to stand. They need practical support, um, they need mentoring, and they need money, frankly. It's expensive to get into politics. That's my second point. Um, third point. And then, finally, the political parties. Um, I think, you know, you've got to fight for every vote, uh, political parties, and I think I'm hearing it from you today. That's why you've turned up, I'm sure. But we think we saw from NSARS the power of that voice. The NSARS movement, five very clear demands, articulated in a very sort of clear, comprehensive way. That shows you the power of your voice. You need to say to these parties, you will only get our vote if your clear kind of objectives are set out. You will, frankly, determine the outcome of the next election. The numbers are there. So back to my first point, register to vote, stand for election, and actually get out and vote on the day. Thank you for listening, and well done, Yaga. Thank you, High Commissioner. I think I will echo her sentiments around the abysmal um, percentage of women representation in our political system. And on that note, say that we're really proud and you know, thankful for all the courageous women in this room. If they can actually just stand up for recognition. All the women who have made the bold and courageous decision against all odds because we know that the odds are often stacked against women to run for elective office. And we're looking forward to, to great, great news come 2023. We had a small strategy meeting with some of the women um, in this room last night. And I will tell you that they're fierce. These this women are ready to make this thing happen. Is Okiki in the room? Where is Okiki? Is she here? So Okiki was here um, with us last night. She ran twice. Um, this is her third attempt at running. And just listening to her, her spirit has not, you know, died. Her spirit is still very much alive. And she's looking forward to, to doing this all over again. And this time, she feels even more ready and, you know, sure of what she's getting into. We're really proud of you all, ladies. Thank you so much. And we look forward to engaging with you over the course of the next couple of year, days. Please have a seat. All right, I think um, that leads us into the plenary session. So perhaps we'll do photo ops first, or maybe invite the members of the, the people who are currently seated on the high table who would not be joining the plenary to 
move back to their seats so that we can move sweetly, swiftly back to the plenary, to the plenary session. And to join us for plenary this morning, we already have Dr. Jumoke Oduole seated. Maybe give them a round of applause as they exit the, the stage. Thank you so much for gracing our opening ceremony this morning. So we have Dr. Jumoke Oduole, who is the special advisor to the president on ease of doing business. Can we please give her another round of applause, even though she's already seated with us? We have also seated Simi Fajemiroku Ajayi, who ran for House of Representatives in the FCT during the 2019 election. I'd like to invite to the podium Mr. Jude Abba, a.k.a. M.I., founder of TASC. And finally, I'd like to invite Honorable Shei Adisa, member of your State House of Assembly. All right. Can you hear me now? Uh, that one is Hello. Ah, yes. So we may have to take turns operating the mic. Okay, so my name is Bella Ann in DBC. It gives me great pleasure to moderate this conversation on public leadership, uh, politics with a difference. The Not Too Young to Run movement has always prided itself um, with setting a different kind of agenda, uh, where the, the goal is to groom young uh, leaders who will go and do politics differently, differently from the way that we've seen it. And that's why it's really important for us to always emphasize the fact that when we talk about young people in leadership, we're not just looking for any young people, we're looking for young people that embody the three C's, what we call competence, character, and capacity. And so as we have over 200 young people from Southwest um, area of Nigeria today, I really want you to keep those three, three C's, you know, rolling in your mind and constantly ask yourself, you know, as a young person, do I represent the core values of what this movement is seeking to do because we really need to redirect this country. Um, we can all agree that in the direction that we're going, it's not sustainable. And we, if we continue in this direction, there's not going to be anything left for the generations after us, you know, to take on. So I'm very pleased to have this very wonderful, astute members of a panel today. I think you all have been carefully selected because of the roles that you've all played in different sectors of Nigeria's economy. And I'm really looking forward to engaging on this conversation with you. I want to start with, with my sister, Simi Fajemirokun Ajayi. Simi, um, and we all have their bios, so I'm going to try to not read them all uh, in the interest of time. But Simi um, has a background as an entrepreneur, right? So she's been in, she is an entrepreneur, still is an entrepreneur, but has been in the space for over a decade before she decided to make the decision to join um, public service and public sector. And mind you, while she was in the um, entrepreneurship space, she also consulted 
for active politicians. So she was very familiar with the political space, but she made the decision to run as a candidate um, in FCT for the House of Representatives under the APC party in 2019. I think, Simi, what, what I'd like for you to share with the, with the young people in the room today, because I think it's really, the, the why is important, is what compelled you to make the decision to run in 2019? Hello. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Bella. Um, and thank you to Yaga for just staying at the forefront of these conversations. Um, my why, why it's very personal. So um, it, it wasn't. I think the uh, speaker from Oyo State said that uh, that your spiritual um, self be your fuel. Um, if I sit here and say I ran because I felt young people, I'm young, I'm vibrant, that wasn't it. I felt strongly from the place of prayer that to get involved. So, and um, for me, it wasn't the right time. I didn't feel I had enough money. I didn't feel I was plugged in enough because I had uh, the last time I was really plugged in politically, I would say it was 2014, 2015. And like everybody knows, there was a lot of discouragement and like, every, like a few people I checked out. So from being checked out <laughs> mentally, let me, you know, um, you, you want to uh, just do your own thing. And so I'm praying about what my next step is supposed to be. And I felt very strongly that to go into politics. And I said, you know, God, this doesn't make sense. Um, I'm, I feel like I'm at my weakest, lowest point. Politics is the last place because it's such a show. It's such a, it's, it's, it's such a game of showiness. You can't go in if you don't have money. You can't go in if your godfathers are not lined up. You know, like, so what are you doing? I thought it was crazy. But I stayed in the place of prayer and it just didn't go away. So I said, okay, if it's you, then you know, you protect me <laughs> and um, you, you know, like Noah's Ark, you know, you give me specific instructions. I'm not even going to say yes, because I have family within the APC, but I'm not even going to assume that's where I'm going to go. You know, so if this person calls me today, then I will know that. <laughs> so it was very like crazy. It, it didn't make sense, but um, take that back. I've also run a foundation um, called Read to Succeed Africa. And I remember being in a classroom with a primary six students. And I said, hey guys, um, tell me, we're, we're doing literature. I said, what's a villain? And they said, oh, they know what a villain is. I'm robber, I'm politicians. And I was like, there's something wrong. So I was like, what's a hero? Said, Who's a hero? They're like, ah, footballers, musicians. And so I said, you know what, there's something wrong. If that's our future, and villains are next to arm robbers, there's something wrong. So putting that on one side, and then having the conviction from a place of prayer, I knew that, and I called a few friends to make sure I wasn't going crazy. Um, I said, who can we support in this 2019 election? And they all laughed at me. No one, you know, then they started sending me messages. They said, you. <laughs> so that's why I ran. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that because, um, again, I would reference the conversation we had with the young women yesterday and, and even for the young men who are running today, I think it's, it, it's really important that you're able to articulate what your why is because you're going to get that question from now till 2023. Why are you doing this? There are, over, there are millions of young Nigerians you know, today who are not exploring this option. Why you? Um, be convinced of that answer and, you know, share that answer, articulate it, 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 it in a way that you're able to win your constituents to your side. So it's a really important question to keep, keep asking and keep, um, keep forming in, in your mind is, is the why. Thank you so much, Simi, for clearly articulating and sharing with us um, what inspired you to run. We're going to get back to you, but I think next I'll go to 
Dr. Jumoke, and I understand that before we go to her, we have a short video that we're going to play, and then, and then I'll pose my question. If the video is ready, we can roll. I don't know how you did this in 50 years. You look at history, who does this? Show me anybody else that has done this in 50 years. I'm, I'm waiting. Mm -hmm. Let, show them to me. This wasn't done by money. Money, money doesn't produce visions. Visions produce money. You've had leadership over here that were visionaries, great visionaries, and their vision was more about the people than the money because you can't accomplish this in 50 years without loving your people first because the people are the ones that's benefiting from this. Look at your health care. Look at your road system. Look at your highway system. Look at your airports. Who does this in 50 years? But who benefits? You're going to care about those people. It's something to be learned about what's been done over here that could be duplicated in the world because it's people with this much money. You just don't have people with this much love for their people. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Jumoke, if any of you have, has followed um, her work in the last few years, I think to sum it up, she is making it easy for people to do business in Nigeria. Whether you're a Nigerian um, here doing business here or you're an investor looking to come into Nigeria, she's done an incredibly good work um, of working with both national and state government to remove those barriers that make it difficult for people to explore business opportunities here in Nigeria. And over the years, because of her work, we have seen Nigeria go down, well, down in the sense, in a good way, go climb up the ladder um, and improve their ranking on the World Bank's ease of doing business um, chart. So, Dr. Jimoke, we're very pleased to have you here in the room. Um, I've had a chance to listen to you speak a few times. More recently, your um, futuristic painting of what Nigeria could be if we really leveraged all of the resources that we had at our disposal. Um, you, you made that speech at the platform recently. And I'd like for you to share with the audience today, what is the imperative? Um, why is it important that we're guided by the right values and the right ethics as we explore a career in public leadership? As public servants, why is this, you know, very, why is this critical, especially now? Thank you, Bella, and thank you so much to all the leadership for this invitation. I was very pleasantly surprised because obviously I'm not that young um, to be invited here. And I said to Samson, I would come. I had to ask my husband because today is our wedding anniversary and he had taken the day off. <laughs> so he, he might join us as well because we're both very passionate about Nigeria. Now, I'm going to pick up from what you just asked Timmy, why did you run? And I like very much what the Right Honorable Speaker of Oyo State said to you just a few minutes ago. He has to remind himself, he has to check himself, why am I here? So he can sleep well at night. When I saw that video of the UAE, and waterworks, I almost cried because it tells us very, very clearly where we could have been. But our future is now, and you are our now. So, why do values matter? Why does integrity matter? Why does capability matter? Why does courage matter? Without these things, you cannot lead. You will end up being the people that you despise today. 
you will end up replicating what you saw above. Why do you want to have an elected office? Is it for power? Is it for visibility, for position? You don't see the parts of it that are not so pretty, that are not so glamorous. Even if you've worked closely with politicians, you can't imagine the weight that they carry. I've worked with the vice president for six years now. How much can you explain to your constituency when you're taking certain decisions? When the things you're struggling to grapple with, what will keep you is who you are. That is your integrity. I love the spirit. I love it. I love it. Everybody should internalize it, not as a catchy acronym, but that is what will keep you. That is what would guide you. That is what would make sure that you finish strong. And you need to have the courage every single day of your life as you wake up, because there'll be days that you don't even want to get out of bed. You can ask them, because you know what's waiting for you. You know the things that you can't alter right now. But what would keep you, what would guide you, is who you are and why you're doing this so that you can look yourself eye to eye in the mirror, nobody else, zero optics, you, look at yourself and say, this is who I am, this is why I'm doing it, and I have every intention of delivering the impact that I was born to achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jumoke. Um, I almost shed a few tears while she was speaking, actually. I got a, a, a little bit emotional. Um, and I must thank you for being here. I think there's no greater demonstration of your commitment to service and to, you know, what this movement stands for than sharing your wedding anniversary with us. We're truly honored. We're really delighted to have you in the room. Thank you. And congratulations. My next question is going to be for Mr. Jude. I think I'll call him Jude Abaga today, on the stage today. When he goes out, he can be MI. Um, I think Jude is somebody that I've really, 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 really admired. I mean, I, I don't star, I'm not easily starstruck, um, but I think it's, for me, it's always heartwarming to see creatives or, um, what do we call them, celebrities, who understand what they stand on, the value that they bring to the table, and more importantly, how to convert that value um, to a greater good. And I think that's something that you've done exceptionally well, Jude. Um, I want you to tell us a little bit about the, the movement that you're building now with TASC. And as you speak to that, talk to us a little bit about what you consider the role of creatives, of celebrities, of, you know, people that have cultural power um, in shaping a different kind of narrative for leadership in Nigeria. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Such an honor to be here and to meet with you uh, before the elections and before you guys get into office and you start to change this country and turn it around. I'm truly, truly blessed to see all of you and I'm so proud of what you guys have done. Um, also, uh, the fact that this is in the Southwest, um, you guys know how important Lagos has been and this, this region has been to the entertainment business. Uh, I'm from Taraba State, born and raised in Jos. Uh, I, I always tell people that coming to Lagos was more culture shock for me than going to the U.S. for, <laughs> for, for college um, because it's its own beautiful, vibrant, you know, tough at times ecosystem. 
um, but it's such a privilege to be here, even though I'm not, you know, um, by uh, birth from this region. I, I always take it an honor throughout my career to, to serve in whatever way I can, you know, the state and the region in whatever way I can, because it's been so, such a blessing to me. Um, I was at, uh, in Uyo, and uh, I, I didn't know that there were politicians around that day. I hadn't read on my work. And so I just spoke and I said, you know, APC and PDP are not good for us. And when I was done, uh, I think it was uh, my guy Ishmael that started talking. He said, first of all, am I? And uh, he dealt with me well that day. But I say that to say that I've had a new perspective, a new lens about the importance of participation, the importance of being in the room, of being counted. Um, especially in this moment where you see a lot of youth are taking the stance that the right way to protest is to stay away from politics and to stay away from leadership. You know, I think that there needs to be a contingent that says, hey, we actually need to be in the room. We actually do need to be heard. We actually do need to, to connect and speak with each other. Um, in that regard, uh, even though uh, it's such a privilege to talk about TASK, I will say that what we're doing, uh, TASK is a creative company, but a big part of what we do is called is community. Uh, TASK is an acronym for Talent, Agency, Stories, Community, Kinetics. And our community piece, which is our front-facing piece, is focused on citizen engagement. And we really want creatives and celebrities and influencers across the board, young Nigerians, to use their platform for some sort of social impact. Whatever it is you're passionate about, whether it's you know, gender issues, whether it's the elections, whether it's education, healthcare, I mean, whatever, you know, pick from the myriad of problems that Nigeria is facing today. Um, we are here and we want to help, we want to continue to improve. I'm very grateful to Yaga for giving us a platform. Uh, if we can sort of get our Lagos State requirements fulfilled in time, we will be, launch we'll be having a festival next weekend. It's a culture, music, art festival in collaboration with Yaga, Osiwa, Stir, a uh, few other organizations, just to have conversations, bring celebrities into the room to have conversations. Um, that being said, I think that um, in the context of where we are today, uh, the thing I was thinking about when I was, you know, watching you guys stand up, especially when they asked the, the women in the room who are going to be running stand up, and I was just looking at you guys like superheroes. Like, I, I thought to myself, I was like, nobody knows what your story is, your own personal story. Nobody knows. We can sit here in the room and we can talk about, you know, doing the right thing or whatever, but you're the only person that knows why you're really here. You know, the deals that you struck to be here, you know, the agreements you have, the godfathers or godmothers that are behind you, what you want to accomplish. Are you there because, you know, this is some sort of economic path to economic freedom for you and your family? Are you there? Are you here because you really want to make a change? Um, and as, you know, as we have this internal vision of the future, which I know everybody here has, what I would like to offer to you as, as um, the video you just shared, which was so powerful. I saw it yesterday with Steve Harvey. I was just in Dubai, and Steve Harvey was talking about Dubai and, and 50 years of leadership. And what you said just, it, 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 uh, it forced it home, that we had that opportunity. We're 60 something years old and, and we could have done the same thing, and it's all down to leadership. I think the thing that, that, that struck me most was the fact that bad leadership requires, in the context of Nigeria, requires effort to, 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 to miss the opportunities that are around us every day as a country. The amazing resources we have, and even just the people. Today we have a majority of young people that are completely disillusioned by politicians, you know, which is part of the reason I'm here, to meet people, to make sure that we're making the connections, we're talking with each other. You know, when we saw the gentleman from APC and PDP going back and forth, they, it, it's not a joke, it's real, they can go in, but they're friends and they talk and they communicate and they collaborate. And it taught me a lesson about being on the other side of someone but being in the room and having a conversation. When young people are, are, are split down the middle on issues of religion or ethnicity, you know, um, are we pushing ourselves away? 
you know, uh, there's a whole contingent of young people, the social media era, the woke era, that sort of uh, teased because they don't want, they, I think really at its core, it's about integrity. They see politics as, as something that has no integrity in it anymore, you know, and, um, but they're important because they are so resourceful. They use the internet to conquer the world. They're spreading Nigerian culture around the world. And I want to say that part of the role in whatever, whatever your personal motivation is, part of the mantle that you hold is to be able to bring everybody into the room to have a conversation about how we can move Nigeria together, forward together. It's, it's, it's something that, if done well, will not just, I mean, you heard the, the, the High Commissioner of, um, speak and say that what happens to Nigeria is impactful not just to Nigerians, but to the region and the world. And so um, I'm just glad to be here to share with you guys, to share my, you know, my perspective. I don't have as much to say as these people on the panel, but um, in whatever way, and then to help, to meet as many people as I can and to say, if you need help as we go along to talk to young creatives, that's what our organization is here for, to sort of close that bridge and that divide and so we can move Nigeria together forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I must tell you that um, at the conference that he referenced, the planning conference um, in New York, it was fascinating to always watch MI. Whenever the, he, he, whenever the conversations about politics and what happens, we call it the secret room of politics or the secret guarding of politics, he got really agitated. You can tell that he was frustrated um, and he was not afraid to show his frustration. In, in those days, you can tell that, you know, what he's really building is something he's truly committed and passionate about. And um, MI, I must say that the movement is really looking forward to seeing how we can work with you and all the cultural icons um, and the creatives in the space to, to rally more, more voices, to push for support of, you know, more young people, young men, young women, young persons with disability um, in the political space. So again, thank you for joining us today. Honorable Shei Adisa, you are there now. Um, so I, I believe you were in Convergence too? Yes. Uh, so you, we, he was one of the young people that we celebrated at the second Convergence that was for um, young candidates, um, young elected candidates. And one of the things that the movement, you know, we didn't struggle with this. I think we always thought that it would be helpful. We want to be able to see um, people like Honorable Shei Adisa four years after. In a way, you're sort of the, not the guinea pigs, but you are the mm, product of the movement, right? So we say it's important to have young people in positions of authority, in positions of leadership. Um, and You've been there now for a few years, and the way that you are able to take on this role and the way that other young people are able to take on this role for the movement will be a demonstration that, you know, that thing that we have been pushing for and advocating for, you know, is really important. Here are the results. So we're very pleased to have you here, and I think my question for you will be actually very simple. Now, a few years in, In what way has your position and, and your participation in politics uh, shaped the leadership journey or you know, shaped the, national, the state assembly in Oyo? What have you contributed uh, to the leadership in, in Oyo state assembly? Because I know that we talk about young people being innovative, uh, bringing new ideas to the table. Tell us some of the you know, benefits of your participation at the State Assembly. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Yaga. Thank you um, for inviting me. I need to recognize um, the Speaker of the Oyo State House of Assembly, my colleagues, and other honorable members in the audience. All right, so one of the things we need to realize that young people represent hope. 
For too long we've been pointing fingers. For too long we've been describing bad leadership. What young people stand for is hope. And so when young people get there, there are some people waiting to say, look at them too. Mm -hmm. They messed up. Mm -hmm. um, and young people should stand for inclusion. Young people should do leadership differently. Um, we need to listen more. From my point of view, I've been in the House of Assembly for almost two and a half years, but I've been in government for 10 years. I worked with the former governor of your state, so I worked in the executive. Um, now I'm in the legislature, and um, I, I, I count myself privileged because I understand government. Um, I have worked with somebody at the front end, so it wasn't totally, I mean, yes, the legislative arm of government was new, but I, I understood how government works, and that has really given me a platform now, we have a young House of Assembly led by the speaker who has um, spoken to us. He was 31 at the time. And we believe young people should bring innovation. So technology is something we should command. Um, so little things like you can watch our plenaries live, even when we are not on the floor. We watch what's happening. People can check what their representatives are doing just by watching you know, instead of it being shrouded in secrecy, we don't know what they go and do there. You can actually watch us live. Um, young people bring energy. You know, I believe we've passed probably more bills um, than previous assemblies. Um, uh, young people also, if you like, where where I think we listen better. And for me, you know, I have put in a lot of structure. So. I have a constituency office, I go back every week. I need to wonder, I cannot represent you if I don't know what you want. You know, I need to be in tune with you part time. You know, and that's the only way to be good at what you do. So when there were security issues, for example, um, we had um, inter-ethnic issues at the time, I could respond quicker because I was there, I, I was listening, you know. Um, and, and so many things like that. If you're really going to get what hurts your people, you have to be close to them. Um, other things that I have done, I think, comes from a point of my why. And I, and, I, and I think we'll continue to hear that. If we're going to do politics differently, it's not about just competence. I can teach you what to do to win an election. I can teach you what to do to run for four years. I, it, it's not the problem. The problem is the person behind that thing. Because if you have capacity, but you don't have character, you become a manipulator. You know how to get things done, but you are doing it for selfish reasons. You know, I know I give rice every Christmas and every Ilea and every, there is a system. But when COVID happened, it hasn't happened before. So there was no template and everybody was looking, what should we do now? And so everybody had to look within, who am I? What values do I stand for? And so for me, for example, one of my values is care. And even though I didn't know what to do, I kept asking myself, how do I show care to my people? And so it's, it's okay to keep focusing on, you know, this is what you do as a lawmaker, but who, who is this lawmaker? And I think for me personally, that, that has been what has differentiated my own time in office. I have tried to live by certain values. I have been able to bring a lot of things because one of my values is collaboration. I collaborate with private sector, I collaborate with public sector, I collaborate with academia, I collaborate with everybody. Why? Because as a House of Assembly member and a minority party in Oyo State, the likelihood of getting many things done may not be as, as, as I want it to be. So I have to look outward. Again, that's a function of the values that you hold. So as young people in this room, uh, I just want to encourage us that um, the opportunities are there, the platforms are there, but let's not focus on just the competence. Let's focus on the character. What values are we going to take in there? If we don't have those things, we'll look like those ones we've been abusing for years. If we don't have that, that care, that emotion, that empathy, that compassion, 
you know, you won't know. If you see water, there is no water. It means nothing to you. There hasn't been water for years. So what? You know, there is no light. Is it new? There hasn't been light for years. But if you care enough, then you take it as your own problem, and then you start to see how to solve it. You understand? And, and that is what is important for me, and that's how I have run the last two and a half years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Adisa, for again reminding us the importance of being grounded in your core values um, and having those core values be your guiding, guiding light so that no matter what happens, you're still grounded. Because again, in politics, we've learned that it's easy to get, you know, to be swung from one side to another, depending on who it is you're interacting with. But when you are grounded, when you know what your values are, what it is you stand for, then it's easy to always come back to that. So again, for our aspirants who are in the room, something else for you to think about is what are your core values? And it will vary from person to person. But it's important to begin to think about that and to articulate what that means for you. The next question I want to ask is, for, is, is to Simi. Um, I had an opportunity to actually experience Simi's campaign from, you know, close up. And the reason why I want to ask this question is that from next year, actually, a lot of people in the room have already started engaging with their constituency. Um, but from next year, it's, everything is going to be, you know, kind of like engagement on steroids. See, me came into politics, again, from private sector, and she had the opportunity to basically go from zero to 1,000 within a space of like a very short period of time. Simi, I want you to talk to us about how were you able to gain the trust of, you know, your constituency? Because I think that that was something you were able to do effectively. Um, why is trust important? And what did you do to gain the trust of the constituency that you seek to represent? Um, thank you, Bella. Uh, trust. One of the values that I have, especially coming into politics, um, is human dignity, treating people with respect. Um, this is a nonpartisan gathering, but I am from the APC family, and people like my brother here, Ismail, working within a party that he's never dealt with me as a woman in the political mm -hmm. sense. He's never dealt with me in a way whereby there's a difference between us. Um, the only time I probably remember that I'm a woman is probably when he stands as a protector role. You know, have, do you have your tickets? Are you going to get in safe? What side of the room are you coming into the stadium and all that? Are you good? Are you okay? And he checks in as a big brother. Um, I have mentors within the APC as well who check in, who call, who pray with you. Um, treating people with respect. One of the best uh, tips I got from the beginning, before I even got in, trying to hire a campaign manager. First of all, my campaign manager said, she will faint, she's too skinny, she was going to fall on stage, she can't, she doesn't look strong, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't look like a madame. You know? <laughs> so he completely dismissed me. But somebody else was in the room and came to me, saw that I was like emotionally drained from the endless meetings and said, I know you can, but one thing I want you to do, people, are, everybody's going to doubt you. You don't make sense. Your size, your culture, your Yoruba woman running an FCT, your religion, everything is going to work against you. But do me one favor. I said, okay, sir, pick up your phone. You're going to, people are going to call you. Pick up your phone. I also had a mentor also that was in from the APC family from the PDP family, um, former deputy governor of Lagos State, Alaja Ojikutu, Ojikutu. And she also said the same thing. Pick up your phone. Um, you're going to be tired. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to come home at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And your first call is going to start from prayer time, 5 a.m. 
pick up your phone. And I thought it's such a basic, um, such a basic instruction. But I obeyed. I didn't give my phone to any PA or SA or whatever. I held my, I only had one phone. So I realized that, of course, you listen to gist. Politics is about all the, you know, gist and stuff. And then they're like, ah, so the uh, aspirants, they don't pick up their phone. You'll be talking to one stupid uh, uh, assistant. But that small girl, if you call her, she'll pick up. And I thought, okay. So I didn't even know people. I had some, there were some days you got so many calls. I didn't even know the iPhone at some point stops cutting off, uh, was it, uh, missed calls or something. And so there were days in the campaign I would take a quick break and call everybody on the missed call and say, hello, ma, Oga, my brother, my mommy, my daddy. You know, like this girl, even if you miss her, she calls you back in the miss, and they're seeing you on stage. They're seeing you go from community to community. They're seeing you share bread today, share rice tomorrow. They, they see that you're exhausted. No time for makeup, nothing. You know, you're on the road. So, there was some, I think the difference between female and male politicians. My brother here can wear the same thing. Nobody would notice. I was wearing the same macara for two days, three days in a row. I'll forget because you just want to jump in the car. But I think pick up your phone. It's so basic. But it's so profound because people felt, it, yes, we, people don't see us. People don't see us. They just say, oh, we can throw rice at them. She said, but that small girl, she did pick phone. She did pick phone. So, uh, you know, and I think when it got round from one community to another community to another community, people start calling to test you. They don't have anything to say. Hello, honorable Simi? She pick phone, she pick phone, then they will hang up. <laughs> so for me, it's just for everyone in the room that's running, I beg you, don't give your phone to an assistant. And it was literally something when I figured out it was something that mattered to people. I used it when I got on stage. I said, the only one number I get to, I don't have two phones. I don't have a political phone. I don't have a business phone. It's just one phone. And they will start texting you while you're talking. And I'm also trying to respond. And it made it bigger. So treating people like they're digging, because our politicians of old, because of the system they were raised up in, it's so transactional. So I throw you rice. Why are you calling me? I've done my part, you know, but I throw you right and I still pick up my phone. Oh, it's something else. So I think that's how trust builds. Thank you very much, Simi, for again underscoring the value of human dignity and um, respect, even in politics, because I think we often treat politics as a different, you know, uh, we have like something that has a different set of rules, but at the same time, you're still dealing with human beings, and it's really important to always remember that it's you know to respect each individual that you come across and treat them with with human dignity. So thank you for sharing that. I think it's a really important nugget to remember as we go through this process. I've been reminded that we are rounding up in four minutes, so I think in the four minutes that I have, I'd like to go around the panel and. Um, ask members of a panel to share one or two things that they would like this audience members uh, to keep in mind as they go through this process for the next couple of um, the next couple of years it's going to be a marathon from now on what um, what parting words or or tips like our friends earlier on mentioned would you like to leave the audience members with um Culturally, in the history of Nigeria, through religion, whatever, we have maybe a context that fetishizes poverty. And so we talk about politics or whatever. It's sort of a, a thing to be ashamed of to say, I want to get rich. I want to be wealthy. And I think that this is the dirty secret that we have that even in politics, you know, when people come, they can't say I'm here. But the truth is wealth frees people. It empowers people. And so there are three things that I think that are very important that everybody here has to understand. Number one, every child that is born in your constituency must get an education to have a chance in the new world. It is a non-negotiable. When you get into that office, whatever you do, one of the critical things is to ensure that the small child that is born gets an education it doesn't matter where it is you can organize the churches and the mosques you can go and get the private businesses people that are educated bring them to places but those children must receive an education that is a legacy that you will leave during your time that will speak volumes for you after the second thing is 
You cannot hold half of your population back economically and expect that a constituency thrive. The women must be involved economically. They must be. They must be freed. It doesn't matter where you are. Find a way for women to be safe, for women to get access to funding, whether it is we're going to crowdsource in whatever constituency, we must bring women into that economic conversation and empower them. And the third thing is that the youth of Nigeria have an incredible uh, ability to grow and be resourceful and to solve problems for themselves if they feel safe. Your police, whoever your police DPOs are in your constituency, let's have a conversation. Where are the places that the police are going to be set up? What is the engagement? Do the communities crowdsource so that the police can be better, take, better, better taken care of so that the interactions between police and young people are not? What are the, all the churches and the mosques and all the public centers during the, the free time, uh, during their free periods? Can young people come in there and learn coding and learn how to play sports and learn how to do those things? If you help your constituency to get wealthy, even you yourself, you will become more wealthy. Your network will go up and everybody will, will, will go up with you. So it's not something to be ashamed of. We want to become wealthy as a nation. And the th those three things I, I, I pinpointed are, are a way, I think, that from the ground level, you can make an indelible mark in, in, in improving the opportunity and the, the chance for your constituency to, to approach that goal and desire. Wow. <laughs> What I didn't tell Samson was that I'm staying the whole day. <laughs> you invite me for an hour. I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. Wow, who's going to leave? Like, I'm learning so much. What Bella didn't tell you about my futuristic thing was that I called out the first Nigerian female president in 10 years' time. So those ladies that were standing up, that could be any of you. So, really, Youth is not an identity, it's not a badge of honor, I'm young. You know why? Because there's nobody that's old that wasn't young. And because you're not going to be, I'm sure Ismail didn't know when the gray hairs started coming out. <laughs> he's an Greek. he's young. <laughs> but your age is not your passport to leadership. It is your character your competence, your capability, your courage. That is what makes you a leader, whether that you're young or old. Now, having put yourselves out as leaders, I'm not gonna to preach to the choir. You know the importance of galvanizing Nigerian youth, by far our largest, most important asset in this country. So a lot of our youth are angry, angry Nigerian youth, we've had answers, we've had it all. What are you going to do to make sure that they show up in 2023? PVCs, the process is now automated. How are you going to ensure that everybody you know, not for your personal election, not for any party, but the power of Nigerian youth to show up and be counted? That is your voice. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, for me, I, I want us to know people don't trust politicians. I, I, if you don't know, please know today. Um, you're, you're starting off with people not trusting you. And so your journey is almost having to prove yourselves. The sins of the fathers have become those of the children. And so what I will say, please close the gap. Please close the gap. What do I mean? Politics, governance has a way of opening the gap, widening the gap. When you get to parties, they want you to sit in a different place. They want you to be your guard at the top. They want to separate you. It makes people even feel more angry. And so close the gap every time. Everywhere you go to, be with the people. Stay with the people. Don't, 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 don't get into that mix of, you know, ah, he's the honorable. Oh, he must be here. Oh, he must be there. It's good. It's honor. But over time, you know, when you get into parties, greet people around. Close the gap. It is such a fundamental thing that I have seen that every time politicians, and, and that's why 
people see, when you are going, they say, see them. Say, the, you know, because why? The gap is always created. So please close the gap. And sec secondly, I think, um, you know, we, we have to realize that we have an advantage. We must use our advantage. We're, we're young. We can use technology. We can use so many other things at our disposal. You know, from the way you do things, the way you fund things, the way you do everything. Please, um, let's, let's do intellectual politics. Let's not do the politics of how they've always done it. There's nothing wrong. We take the experiences from there, but we need to do it slightly differently. You know, when we wanted to raise funds for um, many NSAS, all of those things, it was amazing. We used